Hi, this is Yosapin Bharti and we are here at Open Source Summit in Denver, Colorado and we have with us once again Clyde C. Prasad, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Education at the Linux Foundation. Clyde, it's good to see you again. Thank you for having me back, Swapno. How do you look at AI from the education and job perspective? I think if you pull all the way back, I was looking at this data recently. From the end of World War II, for 60 years, productivity in the US grew at about two and a half percent a year. Okay. And starting in 2000, it dropped to about 1.4, 1.5. So apparently the internet made us less productive, not more productive. 20 years of one percentage point yet less is a big gap. And so I think part of the promise of AI is how do we get back to that productivity growth rate how do we allow people to do more with these tools to, de to, de to deliver more value? Which I think you're seeing a lot of that in some of these early success stories around AI, obviously with Copilot and, and you know, code development. I think that is a good thing, right? Being able to get more functionality out there quicker to more places, to more markets, to more geographies, to more industries. I think the challenge is we're all feeling some discomfort because we had a really good playbook and we knew how it worked. And now it feels like somebody set it on fire. And so we're all trying to figure out what does entry level talent look like? What does development over time look like? Maybe it's not so easy to just go on LinkedIn and post somebody because nobody has three years of experience building a Gentech AI. Nobody has one year of experience, right? And so a lot of the heuristics we used to use in that playbook have blown up and now we're all together figuring out what does this new normal look like with this amazing potential of productivity too, right? This new tech talent report, 97, 98, everybody believes there's value. How do we get the value consistently, reliably across all the use cases? I think that's what we're, we're collectively grappling with. The technology is dazzling. The people and the processes to get there to unlock the value, I think, is what we're all trying to, you know, it's not sexy to talk about, like A2A, MCP, the technology is dazzling. The processes and the people to take advantage of it, to get to the productivity that we all sense is there, that's what we should be spending more time talking about. Instead of looking at, we have AI, let's replace AI with humans versus let's build this skill because you will still need humans to bake those AI skill sets. But what kind of data you have, what kind of disparities you have, where, where you're seeing that, no, right now organization more focus on cost cutting, replacing AI, humans with AI versus investing in humans, bring that because you will need humans, you know, at some point. And if those humans are not very well versed with AI, then you will, uh, you're lost. You know, we have learned this lesson so many times. What are you seeing? Well, I think it's important for people to remain, to have perspective, right? No company ever cost cut its way to greatness. You cut the easy stuff, then you cut the slightly less easy stuff, and eventually, in the analogy, you're cutting muscle and bone. That's okay. Sometimes there's good reasons that you have to do that. That's not how you get to greatness, right? Greatness is innovation. Greatness is making sure you're seeking out the customer's needs. And so, yes, there's a, I think there's a temptation to look at AI through the lens of cost reduction. But it's not the only lens. And I, and I think part of what we need to do collectively is make sure we focus on the bigger aperture of what is this going to enable us to do, right? Look at the edge cases of what we're doing with all the drug discovery and the protein folding, right? Unfathomable, right? You think about the genomic applications. You think about the customer insight applications from looking at all this real-time data. There is amazing power in terms of growth and innovation and outreach we can't let ourselves get so distracted by the potential for some short-term cost-cutting gains that we give up the long-term benefits. Because a lot of those long-term benefits require judgment, perspective, context about the business. That doesn't live in a database. That lives collectively in the people within the organization, right? And so keeping the long-term and short-term balance, thinking about growth and innovation and how you're going to be able to do those things that you could never do before, you have to do both at the same time and you're going to need 
people with context and experience to really get the innovation unlocked. No, that's a very interesting one because when I look at, I don't want to name any company as such, uh, is that when we look at it, they, the focus is more on, hey, these, you know, entry-level jobs, we eliminate. I have not heard a company where they are saying that we are bringing AI in, enabling our workforce, that then we will be able to offer this thing more to the customer. So it's less about what we are doing, how to co cut costs on what we are doing versus leveraging AI and the human workforce to do more. Well, here's a peek at the future of, the, of a potentially not great future. I recently had to have a plumber out. It was $125 an hour plus a service call. The guy was in his early 60s and I was talking to him and he said, well, I, I don't want to retire. I am making so much money. Great for him as a plumber. There are no 20-year-old plumbers. There are no 30-year-old plumbers. Terrible for me as a consumer because if I want an electrician, if I want a plumber. So if you don't feed the pipeline of talent, eventually you pay the price, eventually your customers pay the price. We just need to think about what does entry-level hiring look like in this new AI-powered world. Maybe it looks less like specific skills hiring of, well, I want to go get a software development with experience in X language, and more like I want to bring somebody in, expose them to the business in sort of an apprenticeship model, and then over time figure out which specific functions, because everything's changing so fast. Today, we have a mindset of, I hire Swapnil as a so entry-level software dev in X. I think that's breaking down, but re-envisioning what does entry-level onboarding into the organization look like in maybe a less skill-specific way, but in more in a what's the mission of the organization way. I think that's the playbook we're still writing. We're trying to figure out. It probably is true we don't need as many people with blinders on just writing code in abstract. But writing code in the context of solving business, writing code in the context of agentic models, taking things that were laborious and manual and automating them, we're figuring that bit out, right? And so I, I think the, the panic over nobody wants new software devs is a little maybe overstated. What does that look like? What does that role look like? I think that's what's changing and, and we don't yet have a new normal. But we're going to need those people, right? There was a story recently that one of the, I think, fast food companies implemented an AI agent for order taking in the drive through And you think, great use case, right? Language recognition, data mapping back to the menu. And it was very good. It would take your order, understand, you know, accent, speed, play back your order to you. The first person who then, you know, you give the order, it plays back the order. The first time buddy, somebody said, yep, that's right oh, no, wait, I want to add fries, the thing shut down. Because it, you gave the order, it played back the order, it sent the order off, and it was done. And it hadn't, there was no concept in that agent that somebody might decide to add a pack of fries. Any human who would work for 20 seconds on a line would have told you people change their order, they change their mind after they've left. And so that context of the business, right, the abstraction away from building the basic models the easy part figuring out what the actual process is that your customers are using making sure you're meeting those use cases that's the the bit where the humans add the value that should be where we want the humans to add the value but if there's no human who understands that context you're going to have a lot of people yelling in your drive through line because they're not getting their fries i remember you used to say that you know if you fear that if you train your employee they will leave you know Let's try to paraphrase in the context of AI. In that aspect, AI actually has made people shift their thinking in a direction that I think is actually positive. Because intuitively, most people understand that if I go grab somebody off the street, A, they don't have five years experience or three years experience or even one year experience because this stuff is also new. B, they don't understand the business, right? And so if I'm building a model to replace workflows with somebody who doesn't understand the business. It took me eight months to hire them. 20 or 30% of them are going to be gone in 12 months. And I'm going to have to teach them the business. Versus, here's Swapnil, who's been here five years, who understands the business. Maybe I should spend five or six months cross-training him because he, won't, he will never build a model that doesn't know how to add fries to the order. 
because he understands the business. And so this idea of getting the value of AI is going to require people who actually know my business, I think is unlocking in people's brain a sense of, wow, there's value in, th there's this intangible value in the people I have today. Maybe I should make sure they know how to write a model. Maybe I should make sure they know how to ingest data into a system. Maybe I should make sure they know how to think about the IP implications of loading the stuff in. Because that is an investment that takes hundreds, maybe the low thousands of dollars, but the payoff is immense. And so if, if nothing else, if AI succeeds in getting more organizations to realize that upskilling your workforce is a massive force multiplier, then I think it would have been a good thing. Yeah, I mean, so true. And when I was, when you gave the example of the, you know, food, you know, company delivery, uh, instead of saying that AI augmenting humans, humans augmenting AI, you know, because AI doesn't have, if humans don't have the experience with AI, AI doesn't have experience with what you're doing. So humans will augment it. So it's better to train your employee, retain them, because, and then, you, you know, add value on top of your AI. That will be the right approach. Are you seeing this trend or you're like, we are still in the phase where people are just looking at AI as cost-cutting means. The reality is I think people are enamored of the cost-cutting potential. I mean, obviously there's macroeconomic stuff going on and, and in that environment, people always, the first thing is to look at, at, at cost-cutting. That's sort of a natural thing to do from CFO on down. But I think people are beginning to discover most organizations, I would say even mid-sized organizations have run at least one or two experiments internally with specific workflows. And I think most of them have found that there's real goodness here and there's real productivity and there's real benefits to be had. What they're struggling with is how do I scale it up from the really obvious place to start, whether it's the tier one at a contact center or the order taking line into the rest of my business. And so as they start getting down past the easy stuff, the importance of thinking about people, processes, you know, BCG has this report, the 10, 20, 70, it's 10% tech, 20, um, process 70 people, we're at the very front end of that, right? We're, the, the initial uh, dazzling about the tools and the potential combined with the sort of macroeconomic concern about cost, I think we're still maybe kind of center of gravity is there, but you're starting to see more and more this awareness that actually building the business, actually driving productivity, actually getting better solutions for clients based on data, based on analytics is going to require collective effort within the organization. We're at the front end, but I'm optimistic that businesses are beginning to discover that that is where ultimately the value is going to come from. Yeah, staying in this uh, context and the discussion and looking at your own career, what advice do you have for the companies? And at the same time, what advice do you have for the either the existing employees or potential employees uh, to look at AI, you know, not as once again threat to, to the job, uh, how organizations should leverage AI and how people should also start leveraging AI versus competing with it. Yeah, I, let me start with the second one, which is from the individual basis. This has been true for a while now. I think AI has accelerated the trend. We have left behind the world where you could train to be X and do X for 30 years. That used to be the world, right? You train as a database administrator and you retire as a database administrator. We're all on this journey now of continuous learning. And it's uncomfortable because in the old world, I would master a domain and then I could leverage that mastery. In the new world, it often feels like by the time I master it, it's outdated. And so you're constantly on this learning curve, right? You never feel like you've quite mastered it before the next thing and the next thing. Welcome to the new world. We have all got to get comfortable with this idea that we constantly will have to challenge ourselves to learn new ways of doing things. And that the satisfaction that comes from feeling like we've mastered it is probably something we're going to feel less and less. But the challenge and the excitement about learning is something we have to embrace. I think from the organization side, understanding that people are core to value, understanding that people drive the insights into the customers and the product, and that you do need a pipeline over time. You can't have in 20 years time, everybody retiring and there's nobody to replace them, right? So the long lens, like keeping a long lens if you're an organization about 
what is my talent strategy so that in 10 years time I'm still positioned to be successful is equally as important as thinking about your next quarterly report and what is the earnings statement going to look like. Now, I want to talk about your, I mean, education. This is where you folks leverage AI. It, it makes your life so easy. But you also need educators, you know, actual professors, you know, because AI can only do so much. It's like, I always say, it's like a, a toddler that knows a lot, but you know, you have to somebody. So what are the impact are you seeing of AI on the LF education itself? We are experimenting furiously. We're using it to help us design exams by it's so good at aggregating the data that exists, right? So in our old process, we would try to find 10 experts. We'd say, hey, we need maybe 20 hours of your time over the next 10 weeks. Half of them drop out because they're like, I can't commit. If we can instead go to them and say, hey, this is the first draft AI generated of what we think the core skills are. Help us edit it, help us make it better. Now their time commitment drops to five hours. They're more willing to do it. They're more engaged in it, right? It's more exciting to edit than to write from scratch, as you know. Oh, yeah. Our speed to market to define those skills and to keep it refined, right? Use the tools for what they're good for. The same thing on the content side, right? We are drafting outlines using AI and giving it to an author, say, what do you think about this outline? Instead of saying, write us an outline and then we wait for a month for something to come back, right? And so finding ways to accelerate the bits that, that the people actually don't like to do so that they can do the things they're uniquely good at. We're doing that on the infrastructure side. We're doing that on the content side. We're doing that on the exam side. We still have our whole team in place, right? And so it really has been about accelerating productivity. We're producing more content than we ever had because we can, because we can leverage those tools to do AI generated video and voiceover so that more of it is in the form factor that the younger audience wants, which is five minute videos, right? And so I think if you think about for any organization, when you think in a mature way about how do I use this to really scale up productivity long to meet customers where they are, differentiate the products, there are lots of places where the tools are tremendously helpful. When you're talking about the plumber, you know, in the beginning that that experience is fading away. But at the same time, we also have to continue to evolve. So, and being in this space, once again, what message you have for folks that you cannot just learn a, a skill and you feel that this you are good with this skill for five years. Uh, also, sometimes learning, it keeps you sharp also. Even if you're 60, 70, 80, you will stay sharp. So, so, I, so I want you to just emphasize this idea of evolution as a learner. You know, I think the way I describe it is if you ever, if you get to a point where you feel comfortable that you have mastery, you should be very worried. The world is changing too fast. You have to constantly challenge yourself to find out what's out there, what's new, what do I don't know that I should know that I should be dragging myself up the learning curve on. We have to get more comfortable with the idea of discomfort so that we just keep pushing ourselves to learn, grow and develop. Uh, this may not be apt, uh, but I like uh, like sportsmen, they have to retire after a certain age, you know. Look at Tom Cruise, 67, he's still making movies, but he, his, his own skill and art is evolving. Okay. He has not given up a comfortable, hey, I just want to do that. Mm -hmm. so, so we have a lot of, you know, kind of, we can learn from a lot of real life experiences that if you continue to evolve, then you will survive, it doesn't matter, but if you... Uh, Feel comfortable, as you said. Tom, Tom yeah. learned how to hang outside a plane going 200 miles an hour in freezing temperatures, yeah. right, at 60. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good analogy, maybe, for the challenge in front of all of us. And he did uh, by choice. By choice. <laughs> so, uh, anything else, or do you think we have? No, I, I always appreciate the opportunity. Sit down, swap, and thank you for having me. It's my pleasure, and as usual, you know, I look forward to chat with you again. Thank you. We'll talk soon.